really excited to see that. And I was excited to see it playing at um, Comprehend. Sarah, are you on? Hey, Anna, is my audio working now? Oh, yeah, it's good. I can hear you. Oh, good. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. I had to press another button. Ah, uh, okay, that does happen. I just, I had just texted you to say, I don't have audio, but then I found yeah, another button. Right. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Just wiggling my cords here to make sure I'm all secure. And you got the handout? Yes, I, I put it up. Um, I just uploaded it so that um, folks can uh, grab it. It's Great. a good read, too. Um, I think that's going to be good, especially, um, you know, you, you put it succinctly. I, I enjoyed it. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. And as a person who was not a livestock person, it was pretty easy to follow. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's my uh, my intro beginner one. And I got your email with the weed question, and that's mm -hmm. th those are some of the most common questions that come in, and um, oh, okay. I won't be able to, like, the, I could talk for hours just answering questions about <laughs> each individual weed species, so yes, yes. Um, I totally remind, get me that. To talk, remind me to talk generally about weeds mm -hmm. if I don't, right, um, but right. I, when I talk about overgrazing damage symptoms, I will talk about it a bit then. Okay. And um, we, we decided on this one, you were going to talk and then answer questions? Yeah, that's right. That's what I thought. Okay. I was just looking over my notes. Wanted to make sure I was correct on that. And when I last looked, we had 19 people registered. So. Oh, yeah. And I had several people ask if you record it and post it online so they can I watch do. it later. Okay. Yeah, I do. It's the season. It's the time of the year. So yeah. You know, people are out. I mean, I just I just got off a call. I was working outside myself. So, you know, it's understandable. But what happens, the uh, spring and summer sessions, the going the the, the um, going back and viewing them again, they skyrocket. Yep. So I think this is going to be um, and I did I did send this out to a couple of um, livestock institutes here in um, Mass and in Connecticut and you know, I think this is a good one to talk about um, proper livestock management. I think it's a good one. What's the geographic range of folks who signed up for the webinar? Are they mostly northeast, or do we have them from all over the place? We It's majority northeast, although I did have some people come up from the south, um, somebody from North Carolina, uh, yep. Missouri. I oh, saw cool. a person from Missouri, and that could have been through, I try to send it through my own networks, like the Northeast Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Ag Agriculture Working Group, MESOG, because sometimes there are ranchers that are yep. a part of that. Um, I, um, a couple of friends I know through the Black Urban Growers. Um, so I kind of go through the networks I, um, I have. We do a big social media presence. So I have seen some people coming up um, outside of Massachusetts. Yep. 
Yeah, the, like that the question that came in was from someone actually I know here in Vermont. Oh, good. Okay. That's good. That's good. Yeah, one I have one webinar with a gentleman that came um, was watching live all the way from New Zealand. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, my last couple of webinars I had some folks from Korea watching. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's always fun. That's always fun. And um, I was looking at some of uh, the articles um, that Chelsea Green has for you. And um, again, an easy read, very easy to understand. So. Yeah, and I've got a whole bunch of other handouts. So if you're doing grazing things, like the one I sent you is just kind of my intro that has the glossary and defines a lot of the terms and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I've got loads more stuff that I could send you if you need them. Mm. That would be good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because some of, there's one gentleman um, in the Atlanta area. He's right outside of Atlanta. He just started uh, cattle ranching himself and I met him at an event in Chicago and we were talking a little bit about Grace and he wasn't sure how to do it in an organic fashion. So I'm going to send him this one. I sent him this one and um, um, and the recording, I'll also send him the link to that. So I run into people like that all the time. Yeah. It's nice. You know, I'm trying to, this is the first year that we've added things for livestock. I've always wanted to do it. I just didn't know who to reach out to. Right. <laughs> yep. You well, know. I've got, and also on my website, I, I post all the, you know, webinars and podcasts and videos mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So there's like mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that people can just log in and watch there. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, and then I'm teaching a ton of all day grazing schools. So that. yeah. the, that's really the best way to get this stuff is to find somebody who's doing okay. one of those hands on all day events. Mm -hmm. I think Fort Valley State in the Atlanta area, they are going to do something on Grace, and he's going to go to that. But he said he was going to try and get on this webinar. Well, I'm hoping my dog doesn't bark. <laughs> I've just had I, I um I've got this huge garden here um that oh. surrounds my house. I'm kind of like in the middle of a big pasture surrounded by a hedgerow and then around my house is like blueberries and raspberries and currants and cherries, oh. like all of these permaculture planting that I live in the middle of and the berries are just full on ripe and I haven't had time to really pick, so I've got a whole crew of wonderful neighbors who are here picking my berries. Oh, and, uh, so uh, that would be the one thing that would make the dog bark is if neighbors show up with buckets to go out and get more berries. <laughs> I know the dog is like, well, well what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, that, that would be funny. But that sounds beautiful. That sounds very, very nice. And people start to log on. I usually log on sometimes, um, a lot of times, five minutes, too. I'll see this whole um, surge because they're running from outside, inside. And they're like, oh, I got to get on the webinar. I'm going to put myself on mute for a few seconds. I'll be right back. Okay.
thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We'll be starting in about five minutes. Uh, you can keep yourselves on mute and have your questions ready as uh, the webinar progresses. So we'll be starting in five minutes. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining us. Those who are starting to log in, uh, the webinar will be starting in about three minutes. Uh, welcome to the webinar, and we are so happy to have you with us tonight. All right, everyone, thank you for taking the time out of, your, out of your busy schedule to join us tonight on our webinar series and inspire, inspiring ideas from experts in the field. Uh, we're so glad to have you join us tonight in this latest episode as we talk about uh, grass-based livestock management with our presenter tonight, Sarah Flack. My name is Anna Muhammad. And I am the webinar and food access coordinator for NOFA Mass. And welcome once again to our monthly series, Inspiring Ideas from Experts in the Field. The webinar is in our third year for NOFA Mass, and it is our hope and goal that we can make quality farm and 
uh, garden education easily accessible to everyone, anywhere, at any time. Uh, if you have any questions concerning this webinar, any suggestions, if you'd like to know, learn more about our webinar program and our food access program, my email is Anna at nofamass.org. Feel free to contact me with feedback about the webinar, with any questions you may have. We look forward to hearing from you as always. And really this webinar would not be successful without everyone in the viewing and listening audience. Now, before we get started with tonight's presentation, I would like to thank our sponsor, the Greenleaf Foundation, for supporting the production of this series. The Greenleaf Foundation makes small grants to nonprofits that promote organic farming, gardening, and community de development throughout the New England area, and we're so grateful to have them as one of our sponsors. Um, as well as I'd like to thank all of the NOFA Mass uh, staff and board who have helped to make this workshop possible over the last couple of years, and for the use of our new webinar portal, which right now I think this is our fourth time using. It's proven to be quite a very uh, wonderful tool to use. If you are not a member of NOFA Mass, I really, really would like you to consider joining us and becoming a member. Your membership supports our education and policy work. If you would like to learn more about how you can become a member, feel free to go to our website at nofamass.org. And so tonight, without any further delay, I'd like to introduce our presenter tonight, Sarah Flack. She is the author of The Art and Science of Grazing and the owner of Sarah Flack Consulting. And we actually have a article that she wrote that's attached um, to this webinar that you can actually pull down for your reading and enjoyment. It is very chock full with a lot of information and a very easy and wonderful read. Now tonight's format will be a presentation uh, with questions and answers afterwards. So I really encourage everyone to keep copious notes, uh, keep your questions handy. You can send questions as the uh, webinar is going you can actually use the question button. I'll see those questions and get those to Sarah as she uh, wraps up her presentation. Now we do have some listeners that have called in. Uh, you may have used the phone line. If you have questions and you're on the phone, feel free to text me at 413-214-1237. Again, uh, my number is 413-214-1237 and we'll get those questions to Sarah. So without any further delay, I would like to turn the presentation over to Sarah and uh, get started with tonight's presentation. I am very excited and hopefully you all are excited as well. So Sarah, whenever you're ready, you can start to share your screen and uh, look forward to the presentation. Great, can you see my screen now? I certainly can. Okay, great. So, yeah, I've got a bunch of slides in here that I will start going through and I'm going to try to take all of the questions at the end because I feel like I'll cover a lot of the basic information and probably answer a lot of the questions as I go through. But if anybody does have a really burning question as we go along, especially if I use some, some vocabulary words or an acronym that I need to slow down and define, by all means, um, text that question to Anna or put that in the question box and I'll try to answer those during the presentation but I'll um, I'll try to save the general questions for the end of the webinar so is my audio still nice and clear Anna oh yes you're coming in loud and clear very clear okay great so in addition to the handout that Anna has loaded for you in the webinar um, portal that you can download. I also have a bunch of other free handouts on my website that you're welcome to. Uh, and um, there are also some videos and some pre-recorded webinars posted on that website that will give you some additional technical information. And then that's also my email address there. I don't I don't always get to replying to all my emails. Sometimes I can get a little overwhelmed, but I do try to respond to emails as they come in. So just getting my great. 
So what I'm going to talk about today is grass-based livestock management, and we've got, only got an hour, and so I've tried to pick out what I think are the key most important principles to share with you. And I'm going to start by talking for the first part of the webinar about grazing management from the perspective of the plants and the soils so that we can really understand how we can use the grazing livestock themselves to improve the pasture quality, including the soils and the plants. And then the second half of the webinar, we'll shift gears and look at grazing management from the perspective of the livestock. So good grazing management is what I'm going to be talking about today. And I don't tend to teach a specific type of grazing management, but I would say that in general, the types of grazing management that I see using the really essential principles of good grazing management include management intensive grazing, which was developed by Jim Garrish, who's an excellent grazing consultant uh, who lives out west these days, and then also holistic planned grazing by Alan Savory. And so those are the two grazing systems that really have a name that generally are going to be, if they're being done right, they're going to be following these essential principles that I'm going to talk about today. And that means that you're going to be able to use the livestock over time to make improvements in your grazing system. So good grazing management done right can improve the pasture and the productivity of the plants. It, it can extend the length of your grazing season so that you have a shorter season where you have to feed stored feed. It can improve the soil health, sometimes really remarkably so, with just good grazing management. You can increase or maximize the intake of pasture as a feed source for the livestock. So all of this is combining to lower your feed costs, decrease your fuel usage, and then you have a whole lot of other things that add up to some real economic or financial benefits for you as a farmer. So looking at some of these benefits in a little bit more detail, good grazing management can improve the soil structure. It increases the amount of cover over the soil, and that's both the dead um, residue on the soil cover, the dead plant material, and it's also the living cover of the plant material over the soil, really protecting that soil and the organisms in the soil. It increases the organic matter content of the soil. It allows better water infiltration, so in a high rainfall event, more water can go directly down into the soil instead of running off. It increases the capacity of the soil to hold water, so you can have better plant growth and moisture soils for better biological activity during dry periods and droughts. Better water quality. When it's done correctly, you're going to reduce or eliminate soil erosion and that runoff over the surface of the soil. The good grazing management practices also creates a more uniform manure distribution by the animals themselves. So you don't have to go in and do a lot of mechanical moving of manure in the pasture. You actually can get your cows and sheep to spread it uniformly themselves. So that improves your nutrient management. And then from a consumer perspective, if you're selling meat or milk or other products, you've got this consumer appeal due to animal welfare improvements, some of which are real and some are perceived, um, but it can definitely build your customer base. And then some real environmental benefits and then some distinctly different nutritional quality in the meat and the milk of animals that are grazed in these well-managed vegetative pastures. So this pasture, you can see this lamb standing in here. Um, this kind of a high quality vegetative pasture is going to create, um, in this case, meat, but if this was a dairy animal, it would also be changing the nutritional quality of the milk. So lots of things here that we don't have time to talk about in detail, um, but uh, we'll cover some of these topics uh, in a little bit more detail as we go along. So that's good grazing management. I also want to talk about poor grazing management because the majority of the grazing management in the U.S. and Canada is still continuous grazing management, which is often not very good. And it has some distinct negative consequences for the environment, for the ecosystem in our pastures. So this is a photo of an overgrazed, continuously grazed pasture. In this case, this one's actually in Europe. And you can see that the plants have been grazed so frequently and so short that it has caused damage to the plants. 
So the plant's roots are no longer able to hold the soil in place. The soil has started to be damaged. And so it's important when you're, especially if you're reading some of the articles of, about when is um, eating meat a good thing for the environment and when it is not a good thing for the environment, it's really important to ask in well-informed questions about what type of farming practices are being used to raise and graze those animals and what type of grazing system is, the, is in use and also understand whether it's good grazing management or not. Whoops. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about what good grazing management is. So this is an example of a well-managed grass-fed dairy farm. This is a farm that's not feeding any grain at all to the cows. So this requires a very high level of management and pasture quality. So this is an example of plants that have a nice long recovery period. So they're allowed enough time to regrow after each grazing and they're being grazed down by the cows in a relatively short period of time. In this case, this farmer is using a 12 hour period of occupation. So the cows are getting moved to a fresh paddock twice a day. So this is the most important slide of the day. If you only get through this one and then you fall asleep, you've had a successful evening. These are the two principles that underlie all good grazing systems. So variable recovery periods and short periods of occupation. So this is, these are the two guidelines that it doesn't matter what the grazing system is called. If these two principles aren't being followed, it's probably not grazing systems that are benefiting the ecosystem. So variable regrowth periods means that we are allowing the plants enough time to grow to the correct height or the correct stage of maturity before we're grazing them off again. And the short period of occupation means we're leaving the animals in the paddock for just long enough for them to harvest the right amount of the pasture plants. And we're leaving behind enough residual. So that's the plant material that's still green and attached to the plants so that the plant can start to regrow and we're preventing regrazing of plants during that recovery period. So we're not letting the animals stay in there for so long that they're starting to nibble off plants that are starting to grow again. And by shortening up that period of occupation, we're also increasing the stocking density. And in your handout that you have, there's a section at the end, there's a little glossary where I define a bunch of these terms. Um, but stocking density is an important number to know or uh, an important uh, term to know. Stock density is the total number of animals in a specific paddock at a specific time, and it's often expressed in pounds of animals. So as you make your period of occupation shorter and your paddock smaller, you're increasing the stocking density. Sometimes you're gonna wanna graze with a higher stocking density, sometimes with a lower stocking density. So let's talk about this now from the plant perspective. This is a, just we'll just call this an average pasture plant. We're looking at a grass plant here. And here we've got the, let's see if I can get my, um, I think the pointer is probably showing up for you guys there. So we've got the roots down here at the bottom. And then inside this little green box is some of the really important parts of the plant for us to be able to look at and recognize and also protect from being grazed too short or too often. So inside this little green box, we have the crown of the plant. So that's the lower part of the plant, usually right around the soil surface, sometimes a little below, sometimes at soil surface or above. And this is where the growing points are for new grass plants to start growing out of or new tillers to start growing out of. And this crown is also where a lot of the plant's energy reserve is. There's also a lot of energy reserve for the plant in the lower couple of inches of the grass stem. So this two to four inches of stem just above the soil surface and the crown. If you can prevent your animals from grazing that part of the plant too short and too often, you're gonna be really helping that plant be much more productive over time. Just to give you a couple more uh, plant parts here to define, the, this part here that is the elongated stem with the leaves coming off of it and then the flowers which have turned into seeds up at the top, that is an elongated tiller. And down here at the bottom coming out of the crown are what look like a bunch of 
additional vegetative leaves. And each one of those is potentially a tiller. So it's a little bunch of leaves that just has not elongated the stem in the middle of the leaves yet. So we're sometimes gonna see these elongated tillers and sometimes we're gonna see these shorter vegetative tillers. One of the things we're going to be constantly thinking about in our grazing management is how tall are we going to let the plants grow before we graze it and how much are we going to have our animals leave behind. So here's an example on the left of a pasture which is fully recovered. It's the right stage of maturity and height to be grazed. Some of those leaves in the grasses you can see are about eight inches tall and some of them are over 11 inches tall. So for a cool season perennial grass mixture with some legumes in there, there's also some forbs or uh, the things like plantain and chicory and some dandelion, which are all good grazing species. This is a pretty ideal pre-grazing height for that. If you're down south and you're grazing warm season grasses with some different legumes in there, your pre-grazing height might be taller than this. So it does depend a little bit regionally on what you're grazing. Then on the right, you can see a really nice post-grazing residual. So that's just been grazed off by a herd, in this case of dairy cows, and they've left by, uh, behind anywhere from an inch or two up to maybe four or five inches of post-grazing residual. So that's a really nice post-grazing residual. So here's another poll. This is a farm in New York State, and you can see the there's a guard dog drinking out of the water tub in with a group of lambs that are being finished on grass. So you can see they've got some trees for shade and also a shade structure in there. And they've been in this paddock behind this electric net fence for just an hour or so now. They've just recently moved in and started grazing it down. This is being grazed on a 12-hour period of occupation. So they get moved twice a day, every morning and evening, they get moved to a fresh paddock. And you can see back down in the corner to the left, you can see the short area that was grazed the night before. And a few areas of that maybe has been grazed a little bit too short, but the majority of it is that the sheep were leaving behind anywhere between a, a two and a six inch post grazing residual. So that's ideal for those plants there. And also, when we're talking about these small ruminants, our sheep and our goats, they are extra susceptible to internal parasites. So it's not just the plants that are going to benefit from that taller post-grazing residual. There's actually going to be benefit health-wise for the sheep if we can somehow convince them not to graze the pastures down too short because the majority of those infective parasites are in the bottom couple of inches in that pasture. So talking a little bit more now about how long do we let these plants regrow? So the answer is it depends. That's actually the answer to a whole lot of things having to do with grazing management. Uh, but it really does depend that the amount of time you wanna let the plants regrow after each grazing or after they've broken dormancy after a drought or in the spring after winter dormancy depends on the soil temperature, the plant species, the soil fertility, uh, soil moisture, and so sometimes those plants are going to grow back very rapidly and sometimes more slowly. So this is a growth curve, one of the um, graphs out of my book showing a typical regrowth in the northeast of the U.S. or the Canadian Maritimes or nearby in Quebec. And uh, But this will be pretty common across the temperate uh, regions of the U.S. and Canada. So you can see if we're looking at forage growth on the vertical axis and we're looking at days on the horizontal axis, we're looking at regrowth beginning somewhat slowly, then it starts to speed up a little bit. This, this middle section of your regrowth curve that usually happens a couple weeks in is when you're really tempted and also your cows and sheep are really tempted to go in and graze, but those plants are not ready yet. So you really wanna wait until you get to this ideal pre-grazing height or stage of maturity. 
which in the spring on this farm is about 22 days, but that same exact pasture later in the year needs about 40 days to recover. So this is a pretty typical uh, difference. It takes about twice as long for most pastures to regrow during the hotter, drier part of the summer if they're cool season perennial grasses. Warm season grasses have a somewhat different growth cycle than this. So a lot about grazing management is time management. It's how long are you leaving them in each paddock and how often are you grazing each area? So you're managing that animal impact, both the trampling, uh, the animals spreading their own manure and the grazing impact of those animals and making these decisions about when to graze it, how short to graze it and when to graze it again. So again, continuous grazing, which is just putting all of the animals in one pasture for either weeks or months or sometimes the whole grazing season, that is still the most common grazing system in the US and Canada. And it is a grazing system which typically does do some damage to the pasture ecosystem. And the quickest way to begin to be able to correct that is by subdividing those big pastures, adding more paddocks or more grazing cells so that you can start to have more control over that period of occupation, which is how long you're leaving the animals in each paddock, and those regrowth periods, how long you're letting it regrow. And it isn't just the act of subdividing it. Once you divide it into a number of paddocks, it then also takes some pretty good planning to make sure you're rotating then in a way which really is beneficial to the plants and the soils. So I like to remind myself and everybody else that a lot of this information is not new. A lot of the initial reading I did on grazing management when I was in graduate school was written by Andre Voisin, um, who wrote a lot in the 1950s about grazing management. And then this is an author in this case who is writing in the 1700s about good grazing management. And I like this little quote where he says, a farmer who has a large pasture should have it divided into 15 or 20 divisions, nearly of equal value. It would please the animal palate to induce them to eat it greedily and fill their bellies before they thought of roaming about and thus destroying it with their feet. I am satisfied that in some cases the actual produce of the same field by a judicious management in this respect compared with bad management may be augmented fourfold in the same season. So this farmer is telling us in the 1700s that if you take that continuously grazed pasture and you divide it into 15 or 20 divisions and then you do good grazing management, he calls it judicious management, that you might quadruple the productivity of that pasture. And that is exactly what I've observed in my last 20 some odd years of consulting work with farmers. And I'll say you don't necessarily need to even go to as many as 15 or 20 paddocks. You, you can do this with quite a lot of improvements possible with as little as seven or eight paddocks. 15 or 20 is better. What it looks like. I'm going to show you a couple of slides. Quite a few of these are example farms from my book. In between each of the technical chapters, I put in some real practical examples with photos of farms and their actual grazing systems because the the art of grazing is the creative and very different ways that farmers apply these technical concepts to their farms so that they really work well for their unique situation. So this is a farm in New York State which is grazing dairy replacement heifers and so his fencing is just a single strand of steel wire for his permanent electric subdivisions. And so you can see we're looking at down a long narrow paddock running down the hillside. And then there are two more long narrow strip paddocks further over to the left. So that creates these larger grazing cells. And then he's subdividing each of these cells with a single strand of poly wire on temporary posts that he can move around. So that allows him to change the paddock size, change the stocking density, change the period of occupation.
So you can see right in front of us is a pasture that is not quite ready to graze, but it's getting close. Further down this strip is an area that was grazed more recently that's starting to grow back. And then over to the left are two other strips, each in different stages of regrowth. So by having these different areas regrowing at different stages, it gets easier to then move the animals around and find an area that is regrown and ready to graze. This tank in the middle of the pasture is part of the pasture water system so that he can provide a water tub for the animals in each paddock so they can stay in each paddock and have all their needs met. This is an example of a dairy farm in New York that doesn't use any electric fence. And I've worked with quite a few Amish farmers who do all of their grazing management with no electric fence and some of the consulting work that I've done overseas in some countries for various uh, cultural reasons, they don't want to use electric fence. So this whole farm is doing it with barbed wire. And I will say it's a lot more work, it's more labor, it's more expensive to install than most of the electric fences, it takes more maintenance in the long run, and you end up with fewer paddocks that tend to be a little bit larger. But this farmer is a great example of somebody who is still able to do really good gra grazing management with these fixed multi-paddock systems. So then this farmer has adopted, um, this farmer is actually also Amish and is using electric fence. And he is using a computer operated gate opener. So this is a bat latch, this little blue thing here. And this is running on a timer. And in this case, every hour, this is going to drop this little white handle on the spring gate next to the bat latch gate opener. This spring gate is going to pull back out of the way and these cows are going to walk into their next paddock. So this is an example of a farmer who was trying to figure out how to move to smaller paddocks so that he could have a higher stocking density and more intense animal impact without increasing the amount of labor that he needed. Because if you're gonna to go to smaller paddocks, higher stocking density, that means you still need to provide enough feed for the animals in those pastures. So you're gonna to have to move them to another paddock more frequently to make sure you're meeting their nutritional needs and getting that animal impact. So either he had to walk out every hour and move the front fence forward so that they were moving into fresh feed, or he has to get in this case, the bat latch to open the gate for him about every hour. So now I'm gonna go through a bunch of slides just to look at what the regrowth looks like at the different times of the year. So this is an early spring pasture being grazed by a sheep. And for those of you who know sheep, um, this sheep is definitely grazing shorter than is ideal from a parasite perspective. She might be eating some parasite larvae or, or um, getting infected in the bottom couple of inches of the pasture there. But it's spring. None of the pastures on the farm are quite ready to graze yet. But if you wait for your whole farm to be ready to graze before you start grazing, by the time you get around your first grazing rotation, everything's going to be over mature. And so you've got to start grazing something first thing in the spring that is not yet ready to graze. So my advice to you in the spring is this is going to be one of those times where you're just going to have to graze something that's not ready. Have that be a different area each year. Move that uh, too early grazing animal impact around to different parts of the farm. And don't just always start grazing right next to the barn. And there is actually some benefit from grazing a few too early or too short every now and then because you can shift the plant species composition towards more sod forming grasses and higher plant density. So if you have that early spring too short grazing in an area that's say getting overtaken by over mature orchard grass, that might be a good area to start your early spring grazing the next year. So this is what the pasture looks like a couple of weeks later, using a grazing stick here to measure the height and the amount of dry matter in the pasture. You can see some of these grass tillers have gone from being just vegetative, as we saw in the previous slide. These are just vegetative. We don't have elongating tillers yet. But in this slide, you can see some of these tillers are starting to elongate as we get into that spring. This is what the cool season grasses do in the spring. But from a plant perspective, these grasses still are not quite ready to graze. 
These grasses with the legumes in them are now ready to graze, but obviously you don't want to wait till your whole farm looks like this before you start your grazing because then your farm will really get ahead of you and be um, too many pastures with overmature grasses in them. So here we do have some grasses that from an animal nutrition standpoint might not be vegetative enough, might have lower digestibility lower energy, but there's plenty of leafy vegetative material, both the grasses and the legumes, the dandelions and the plantain and some forage chicory that's in here. So the animal's nutritional needs are going to be met and these plants needs have been met as far as getting an adequate recovery period. These grasses are also fully uh, mature. So from a plant perspective, these grasses are quite happy with the length of this recovery period. But from an animal nutrition standpoint, these are now very overmature with low digestibility. So this is going to be harder to meet the animal's needs. So the plants will grow really differently at different times of the year. So the cool season grasses will head out and make their seed heads earlier in the year and then the majority of them once they're grazed off or mowed off in that late spring early summer will grow primarily vegetatively for the rest of the year so then your pasture might look more like this when it's fully mature so these are plants that are fully recovered, ready to graze. You can see they're kind of brisket high on a Holstein, so it's a nice height. This is a nice mixture of several grass species with two or three different legume species in it. So this is another set of slides so that we can look at what then the next regrowth cycle looks like. So in this slide here. Imagine that these cows in their 12-hour period of occupation graze these plants down really short and then they leave the pasture. This is what it might look like in as little as three days. So these very pale green leaves with the flat tops on them are leaves that have been bitten off by the cows and have elongated already by two to four inches within just three days. We've also got some small white clover leaves that have already grown up to be four to five inches in just as little as three days. So this is a really important way to remind ourselves that that period of occupation needs to be short and the faster the plants are growing the less days in a row you can leave the animals in a paddock because if we left the cows in this paddock for as long as three days by day three they're starting to graze plants that are actively regrowing and so they're going to be particularly damaged to that damaging to that energy reserve storage of the plants so this one's not ready to graze Here's this same pasture about a week later. So you can see right in front of my hand here, you can see some of these bitten off leaves that have elongated, turned dark green and photosynthesized and provided the plant with energy so that they can grow these new leaves. And you see the new leaves are the ones with the pointy ends. So we've got a whole bunch of leaves that are at least five and a half or six inches tall, but this is still not ready to graze though if your animals get loose and get here in here, they're going to love eating this area. But from a plant's perspective, they are really not ready to graze because they've not had time to completely replenish their energy reserves for the plant regrowth. So again, here on the left, I'm using my boot this time to measure pre-grazing height. These plants are not ready to graze yet. They're just too short. The ones on the right now, they, those ones are ready to graze. You can see some of them are eight or nine inches tall. Some of them are 11 or 12 inches tall. And I want to say that a lot of what determines what grows in your pasture, whether it's weeds or different grass species or different legume species, your decision as the manager about what height your plants should be and what stage of maturity they should be when you start grazing them and your decision about how short to graze them down is really what determines what ultimately grows in your pasture. So if you want to have high density sod grasses that are shorter, you need to choose a shorter pre-grazing height and a shorter post-grazing residual and you will quickly change the plant species in your pasture from being things like orchard grass and Timothy over towards being Kentucky bluegrass and white clover. And then if you decide you want more of those taller elongating grasses and taller bunch grasses, move to a taller pre-grazing height and a taller post-grazing residual left behind after grazing, and you will 
change the grass species and legumes to taller ones in your pasture. And that's all without spending money on seed. So let's look at a few slides of post-grazing residual because I find this is one of the most challenging things for us to do. So this is an example of a nicely managed post-grazing residual, but it looks very tidy because the previous grazing of this pasture, it was uh, clipped or mowed. And so we don't have a lot of messy seed stems and things. So this one's pretty easy to be able to say, yep, this looks like we let the cows graze enough of this off and we can leave the rest behind. But this is also a really good post-raising residual. This is a dairy sheep flock in southern Vermont. It's one of the example farms in my book. And the farmer is not going to force the sheep to graze any more of this. All of those standing seed stems that you can see there are fairly low digestibility. And so he's let the sheep graze as much as he wants them to graze, trample the rest, and leave some of the stems there. He's also not going to come in and clip this area because he knows that it's going to grow back through this trampled stuff and the next grazing will be fine. So we're not forcing the animals to graze all of it, and we're not immediately jumping to do a post-grazing clipping. It's another example of a case. This is a farm grazing a mixture of both warm season and cool season grasses down in Maryland. And this is where the beef herd has just gone through and grazed all the good stuff and trampled lots of grass. And this farmer is also choosing not to clip off these seed stems because they know that they're about to go into a drought period and they want to leave this material standing here to shade the soil and keep the soil moisture high and keep the soil temperature as low as possible so they get good growth. And here is an example of a farmer who grazed through an area a couple of times, did not do any post-grazing clipping, left lots of standing seed heads and lots of trampled material behind, went into a drought, and then got this lovely vegetative regrowth that has come up between this through the trampled material. And he was getting really good regrowth specifically because he did not do a post-grazing clipping. So I'm not going to tell you that you should never clip your pastures because there are definitely situations where you do want to use that as a tool if you have a specific weed pressure that you need to do a post-grazing clipping to prevent seed production in those. Or if you've got a high-performance dairy herd, whether it's sheep or cows or goats, and you need to remove a large amount of material that's standing that's going to slow down the grazing herd or flock the next time they graze through, then you may want to do a very strategic, carefully timed post-grazing clipping or pruning of those plant materials. But I do often find that clipping too often and clipping at the wrong time is damaging the productivity of the pastures and in some case encouraging weeds if it's not done right. So I want to talk a little bit about overgrazing damage because this is the primary cause of a lot of the problems in our pastures, including weeds. There are some weeds that even without overgrazing damage will have problems with them, but a lot of times things like buttercups, for example, are often caused by overgrazing damage. So overgrazing damage happens when livestock graze a plant while it's still in that active regrowth stage, growing from its energy or carbohydrate reserves instead of having enough leaf area that it's growing from active photosynthesis energy production. And it commonly happens when animals stay in a paddock for too long or return to the paddock too soon. And this is just some examples of when we commonly see overgrazing damage. In the fall, when you take down a bunch of interior fences and just give the animals a whole pasture area to clean it up, you can do the same thing by mowing your pastures down in the fall. You can do overgrazing damage by having a fixed rotational grazing system where you're grazing the paddocks in the same order at the same speed throughout the year, even though the plants are growing at different rates of speed. Anytime you leave the animals in the pasture for long enough for them to start grazing regrowing plants, which typically in the northeast and temperate regions can be as soon as three days, and then going in and clipping a pasture after it's been grazed, but then the regrowth has started. 
And I also want to be really clear that I'm talking about pasture, which is managed as a crop, which is harvested by the animals. I'm not talking about pastures where you're giving animals access all winter, uh, where it's really becoming a heavy use area and they've got access when the soils are, say, thawed and wet in the winter. So you've got soil compaction and damage of the soil happening. You might strategically be letting the animals have access to a pasture in the winter, but it would be for a specific reason, such as bale grazing or grazing stockpiled feed. So I just want to briefly mention, I've been talking about pre-grazing height, but pre-grazing height by itself doesn't actually give us enough information to know whether a plant is fully recovered and ready to be grazed. And so in addition to height, I also like to pick individual grass tillers and count the number of leaves just as another tool in the toolbox of, of developing our observation skills to see if plants are at the right stage of maturity. So this is three different grass tillers from the same bunch of grass in a pasture near my house. And if we look at the one on the far left, we can see there's one lower leaf here which is leaf number one. And then we've got this central leaf coming up in the middle, which is still in development. So we'll call that a half. So that's really a one and a half leaf stage. So that is not yet ready to graze. This middle grass tiller is almost six or seven inches tall. So from a height perspective, we might consider it pretty close to being ready to be grazed, but it's got the same number of leaves. It's still in a one and a half leaf stage. So it's not ready. Then when we look at the plant all the way over on the right, it has one, two, three fully developed leaves, um, one of which is actually starting to die a little bit, and then it's got a new central leaf. So this one's in a three and a half leaf stage. And so I would consider this one as being reaching that re ready level, that maturity level so that it could be grazed. And you're going to find as you look in your own pastures that different grass species will grow and accumulate a different number of leaves before some of the lower leaves start to die off. So you'll have to practice this in your own pastures. But this is another really useful way to get a better sense of whether your plants are at the right stage of mature. So again, just wanting to look at the fact that your decision on when to graze, what stage of maturity, what pre-grazing height and then how short they graze it really will determine what is going to grow in your pastures. So here's a pasture where we can see there's a lot of these lower sod growing grasses in the foreground. And then we've got these little bunches out here, which are bunch grasses. And then mixed in here are some jointing or elongating grasses, such as Timothy, that tend to like to grow taller or smooth brome grass. And so this farmer has been choosing a somewhat shorter pre-grazing height and post-grazing residual. So they're starting to lose those taller growing grasses and, and the taller growing bunch grasses and getting more of these shorter sod growing grasses. So just an example of how that changes your species. And this is without doing any seeding or anything. So I'm putting this slide up again because it's the most important slide. Um, just a reminder that the, the guidelines are we need to have variable regrowth periods. And hopefully that makes a little more sense to you now. We're changing how long we let those plants regrow depending on what our goal is and how fast they're growing. We want short periods of occupation, again, because we might want to have higher or lower stocking de densities depending on our goal and how we want to have that animal impact hitting the pasture. And we want to be getting the animals out of there before they regrows, regraze plants that are regrowing. So the, my favorite way to teach this information is in a full all day grazing school. And I do have several of those scheduled. If you go to my website, you can find there's a bunch of short um, one to two hour workshops that I'm doing all over the, the US um, and some in Canada. And then there's some longer format ones that are half day and full day. And this is some of the information that we can really dig into and have some fun with in the all day grazing schools, where we can really look at what I call the grazers toolbox. And these are all of the ways that we can use the livestock themselves to improve our pastures. And then when we get to a point where we think, mm, no, we can't quite fix this just by using the animals, we might need to use some other tools also, then we can talk about 
when do we want to bring in some soil fertility amendments or some seeds or do some tillage and aeration to either alleviate soil compaction or reseed a whole area. So I know I want to have plenty of time to talk about the livestock needs. So I'm just going to go through a few slides on looking at grazing management from the livestock perspective, and then we'll stop and just take some questions. So I wish this guy still wrote, did cartoons. They were just the best cartoons for livestock grazing systems. Uh, so talking about meeting livestock needs on pasture, we need to meet their nutritional needs. That includes their energy needs and protein, also their need for minerals and water. In a well-managed grazing system for a ruminant, so cows, sheep, and goats, you're frequently going to be able to meet most or even all of their energy and protein needs from just a well-managed pasture. But you're always going to need to supplement with minerals because all of the minerals that you need are not going to be present in the plants in the right proportions that the animals need, and obviously they also need water. But in addition to that, we need to make sure we're managing the pasture in a way so that we're allowing your herd or flock to be able to express their animal behavior and have comfort and meet their animal welfare needs. And then we're also trying to maximize pasture intake to minimize your feed costs. So I'm going to focus a little bit on that idea of maximizing pasture intake to minimize feed costs. So these are some of the strategies for maximizing forage dry matter intake. DMI just stands for dry matter intake. So we need to have enough forage availability. It needs to be highly digestible and palatable so they can eat it. We need to make sure we're paying attention to post-ingestive feedback, which means if an animal eats one thing, for too long, they're going to be craving something different. So we can actually change what they're being fed in the barn or move them from one type of pasture species mix to another to increase their intake. And we want to make sure that the height and the density of the pasture allows them to maximize the amount of dry matter per bite. And we don't want to force them to graze it down too short because that inhibits their ability to get enough dry matter intake. I'm going to go through some of these slides kind of fast because we don't have quite enough information to get into this. Um, but if people have questions on it, we can come back to these. So I just want to show you this one slide so that you can understand kind of how amazingly remarkable these ruminants are in their ability to go out into a pasture and meet all of their nutritional needs. So this is one of the cows actually on my dad's farm. This is an American milking Devon. And her dry matter demand, so the total amount of dry matter she needs from pasture to meet her nutritional needs is 35 pounds of dry matter. But pasture is 80% water, sometimes more water than that. And so that means when we do the math, she needs to eat about 175 pounds of this pasture. And so if you went out with a scythe or a mower and cut that, that would be a pile of hay that would probably be, you know, mid-thigh height on me that would be several feet wide and several feet long. And so she's actually going to have to fill her room in, twice in a day to meet her nutritional needs out on the pasture. So that means us as the farm manager, we've really got to figure out how to make that grazing harvest of the pasture as easy as possible for her. There's also some really interesting differences in between how uh, the small ruminants, especially the goats, graze and the cows graze. And there's a whole section in my book on this where I talk about some of the physiology and anatomy differences between these two animals. But in general, our cows are going to want to use their tongues for grazing. They like to wrap their tongue around the forage, pull it into their mouth, and take a big bite. Whereas the goats and the sheep are going to use their very muscular lips which is why they're able to do selective grazing and eat the leaves off of a rose bush or go into the forest and eat and meet their dry matter needs in a way that would be much harder for a cow to do. And there's some other really interesting differences in those two. So depending on the types of animals that you're grazing, it's really worth studying their own grazing behavior as you design your grazing system. So I'm just going to show you a couple of videos starting with grazing. So watch how she's using her tongue to wrap around the pasture plants and pull it into her mouth. And then she's breaking it off between her gums and her teeth. And so from her perspective, this pasture is 
pretty decent, but it actually be a, too short. She's having to take a lot of bites, separate bites, before she gets a full mouthful and swallows that. Cow's perspective, we'd like to have that be just a little bit taller so she could get a fuller mouthful in each bite. But it's really not a bad pasture. So now we're going to watch this sheep. Um, this is a lamb grazing. So watch how different this is. It's using its lips. It's variably sorting the pasture plants and only eating exactly what it wants. From a parasite intake perspective, this lamb is too close to the ground, um, but it's hard to convince them not to. <laughs> um, but the other thing to look at is look at how much faster that bite rate was. That sheep is taking a lot more bites per hour or per day than the cow was, which is one of the reasons that the sheep and the goats have an easier time quickly filling their rumen, even if the pasture height isn't ideal, whereas a cow does much better with that taller pre-grazing height. Um, okay, so all of my photos didn't show up on this slide for some reason, but this was just a reminder on the bottom, um, the, the photo that is showing up is the, um, there's a mineral feeder in here, and then the other two slides, one was of shade available in the pasture, uh, and then the other one was of having your water tub available in the pasture, since we don't have time to talk about all of the other animals' needs. So I highly recommend having a pasture monitoring system and also a livestock monitoring system. In the pasture monitoring system, you are looking at, you know, how are your plants and soils changing over time? Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? And there's a whole series of systems you can do for that plant and soil observation. We have a similar set of observation and monitoring things that we can do to make sure we're meeting the animals' needs. This can include everything from looking at room and fill which in our ruminants is going to be easiest done by looking at the left side of the animal. It's easier on a cow than on a sheep because they haven't got wool. Um, but this little triangle under the short ribs on the left side of a cow is the spot that you can look for rumen fill to see if you've gotten enough dry matter from pasture into its rumen. We're also looking at body condition, which is going to change a little more slowly. That's the measure of the fat and muscle between the skin and the bones to tell us um, how much um, condition it's either losing or gaining on the pasture. Rate of gain for growing animals can be really helpful. Reproductive performance, whether our animals are getting bred back when we want them to and staying uh, staying pregnant and lambing or calving or kidding on time. We can do manure scoring where we actually look at the texture of the manure to see whether the energy to protein to fiber balance is adequate in their ration. The next word is an acronym, MUNS, milk, urea, nitrogen. That's a way for dairy animals, if we can look at the milk, the milk, urea, nitrogen test will tell us that energy to protein balance. We can look at milk production amounts in our lactating animals, and we need to keep an eye out for heat stress. So just one final slide, and then we'll just do questions. So we're looking at how do we maximize pasture dry matter intake from an animal perspective. To do that, we want a higher density of plants that have a good vegetative leaf area, so it's more palatable and nutritious. And that's best done by using these short periods of occupation, so you're not leaving the animals in the paddock for too long. And we want to make sure that before the animals go into those pastures, that those pastures are getting a long enough regrowth time to allow that ideal pre-grazing height so that that cow can get the right amount of pasture in a single bite and not have to take lots and lots of bites because the pasture is too short. So that's from the animal's perspective. And it's really a win-win situation because the way that we can use those same animals to improve the pasture plants and the pasture soils is exactly the same thing. It's these relatively short periods of occupation and regrowth periods that are allowing the plants enough time to fully regrow and recover. Okay, so... We can take some questions now. All right, all right. Well, we do have a few questions that came in. And uh, I wanna say first, thank you for such an amazing 
an informative presentation and uh, I, hopefully everyone was as engaged as, as I was and uh, I could tell by the questions that were coming in. But uh, one particular question is about the type of grasses. So can you identify some good warm season grasses to um, fill in the, in the late grazing season for the Northeast? Okay, so there are, um... Actually, I put a slide in about this because I thought I might get this question. <laughs> so um, here is a growth curve for our cool season forages and grasses and our warm season forages and grasses. So the lighter colored um, double humped growth curve here is our cool season forages. So you can see that they grow like mad early in the spring when our temperatures are lower and soil moisture is good. This is when we get the majority of the hay crop um, pastures are growing like crazy and hard to keep up with. Then we get this kind of midsummer slump when things are hot, hotter and drier and these cool season forages don't grow as well. And then we get a real burst in the cool season growth again going into the fall, um, though that tends to be more vegetative and l higher quality than the early higher production of the cool season grasses. So that's your cool season forages. So those are things like orchard grass and perennial ryegrass, um, your, your meadow fescues, timothy, all of those really common cool season forages. The warm season grasses are really different plants and they have a different physiologic mechanism. So they are able to grow well in hotter weather and in drier soils. And so they grow in the middle of the summer when things are hotter and drier. And they can actually nicely fill in this midsummer slump in the cool season forages. So the warm season forages for those of us who are up in the north, I'm in northern Vermont, are usually grown as annuals, not always, but usually grown as annuals. And they include annual crops such as millet, which is great for midsummer grazing and you get multiple grazings from it, but you have to plant it every year. Uh, also the sorghum sedan grasses, and there, you can even do it with corn. Corn is a cool, is a warm season grass. Um, so those are the typical ones for the midsummer warm season annuals. If you go further south, you can you get into areas where people are growing warm season forages as perennials. And these include things like switchgrass and gamma grass. Um, there's some. Um, less desirable weedy warm season grasses like Johnson grass that are uh, common in a lot of the pastures on farms that I work with down south. Then if you're looking to extend your grazing season into the fall and you're up north here, you're probably not going to be looking so much at, the, at a warm season forage. You're probably going to look more at either stockpiling your existing cool season forages or perhaps growing and grazing a brassica crop um, or something like oats and or oats and peas or something like that. Okay. And referring to your slide on clipping, when is the right time to clip? And could you define exactly what clipping is? I'm assuming you're referring to a type of mowing? Yes, I'm really glad somebody asked that question. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, clipping, if it's done correctly, is more like pruning in the same way that you prune an apple tree so that you improve the way that the tree grows in the next um, you know, harvest year. And so the best, um, most common good uh, clipping or pruning of a pasture is you will graze a pasture off in a short period of occupation. You take the animals out of that paddock and you immediately go in as soon as you take the animals out of that paddock and you clip off whatever the problematic material is in that pasture. So maybe you've got a bunch of, um, I think one of the questions came in was about um, knapweed. Um, if you've got knapweed out there, you may want to go out and mow as soon as you take the animals out so that you are taking off the knapweed seed heads before it produces more seeds. Or if you've got a high production all grass dairy herd and you're concerned that you've got way too many tall fescue or orchard grass seed heads out there, you might 
mow off that pasture as soon as you take the cows out of it so that when that pasture regrows, in that case, you're not dealing with a weed problem, you're just getting rid, rid of those seed heads so that that regrowth when it comes back is mostly vegetative and easier for the cows to harvest. Okay. Um, now I have kind of a three part question here. When you bale graze, do you hold a lot of concern for the pasture plant's height of maturity? Do you move fencing around? Or is it a big paddock that you're feeding out bales on or after the ground freezes? Great question. So bale grazing, for those of you not familiar with that, is the practice of during the non-grazing season, you are putting bales of hay or stored forage of some sort out in the pasture and you're moving the animals around and essentially feeding them their hay out on the pasture. And the reason you're doing this is it's a great way to spread that waste hay and then the manure from the animals as they're grazing it out onto areas as a way to build soil organic matter and um, improve soil fertility. The the challenge with it is if you do this at a time of the year when the soils are not frozen and they are wet and saturated, so say you're doing this in the middle of the winter and you get a thaw, you can do a lot of soil compaction damage to those pastures. So bale grazing has to be done really carefully at the right time of the year. And the, the person who asked the question is correct in that you may not want to give them just the whole pasture. You may want to be moving a fence in front of them and potentially in back of them to spread that animal impact around. But in some cases, you're able to just put them in a large pasture, but go out every couple of days or every day and put the bales or the hay in a different spot and you can move the animal impact around that way. So I've, I've seen this idea of bale grazing as a great way to improve marginal pastures and boost soil fertility on some farms, but I've also seen bale grazing when it's done incorrectly create really terrible soil compaction problems. Um, so it's, it's a fantastic tool, but you definitely have to do it right. Okay. Uh, the mineral feeder that you showed, a uh, question came in, is that mineral feeder a brand or is it homemade? That was a really awesome, inventive, homemade mineral feeder. I've actually got an entire presentation of just really cool inventions that farmers have come up with. Um, so yeah, that one had a brush on it that was set up so that there was um, an organically allowed fly repellent oil in it so that when the heifers went up and scratched themselves on the brush, they were getting a little bit of fly repellent on their back. And then on the other side of that metal contraption, there was a bin with a lid on it that moves around depending on the direction that the wind is blowing that keeps the rain from falling in the loose mineral mix as it in, in there. Um, it's kind of heavy. It had to be moved around with a four-wheeler. It was hard to move around by hand, um, but that was definitely a nice um, invention. Um, but there's a lot of different types of portable mineral feeders that are lighter weight than that and don't have the, the scratching brush on it too. Okay. Uh, coming up to our last couple of questions for the night. Do you have thoughts on dealing with problematic weeds like Canadian thistle specifically? Okay, Canadian thistle. I was hoping nobody would ask me about Canadian thistle. Um, uh -oh. No, I'm just kidding. But um, <laughs> so um, when I'm dealing with a weed problem, I try to figure out, is it an annual weed? Is it a biennial weed? Or is it a perennial weed? And if it's an annual or a biennial, there are a bunch of different ways to get rid of it by interrupting its life cycle, preventing reseeding, doing some clipping. There's a whole lot of things. So if you had asked me about bull thistle, which is a biennial, I'd say, well, you know, the first year it grows a little tiny rosette and then the second year it's going to produce its seeds. And so let's look at how we can attack it separately and differently in each of those two years. But Canada thistle is in the category of perennial weeds. And so once it's established, uh, it just develops this tremendous root system. And so it's spreading by these perennial roots as well as spreading by seed. And uh, it's obviously pretty unpalatable. There are a few farms where people have been able to get certain classes of livestock to graze it. 
uh, but for the most part, you're going to have to rely on um, two things to deal with the Canada thistle. Uh, and I'm not guaranteeing that this is necessarily going to work. Um, one is to focus on uh, preventing it from making more seed and preventing it from spreading by roots. So if you're doing any sort of tillage in that area, be really careful to clean off any of the root fragments before you move that tillage equipment somewhere else. And you probably do want to do some strategic clipping or mowing of that plant so that it's not making a zillion new seeds. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that is probably the most important thing to think about with these really um, persistent perennial weeds, whatever they are, is don't put all of your attention on the weed. Focus on the other plants that are in that pasture, which are the ones that you want, and make sure that you are doing everything possible to meet the needs of those really good productive plants so that they can have a competitive advantage and not be totally squeezed out by these weeds. The more you can increase the plant density of the good cool season grasses and legumes if you're up north and the warm season perennials if you're further south, the more you can increase the plant density of those good plants, then the lower the chances are that a new weed species can get established in our pastures. But I will say one of the many challenges that we're seeing with climate change is as we get these weird incidents of high rainfall events and then we're getting uh, dry periods and droughts in regions where we have not faced that before, that is decreasing the plant density in a lot of the pastures. And so we are starting to see new weed species and higher weed pressure on a lot of the farms that I'm working with, even where they're doing really good grazing management. So we're kind of having to increase our skills as grazing managers to try to continue to focus on really keeping those perennial forages as healthy as possible with high plant density. Okay, and our last two questions for the night, um, I'm going to ask them together. Uh, when, to, when should you plant annual summer grasses and can you bale graze on snow? Um, I will answer the second one first because it's easy. Uh, yes, you can bale graze on snow and on frozen ground. Uh, when you are um, the, the main problem with bale grazing is if you don't have snow and you have thawed ground that can get muddy. Mm. Um, so that was the easy question. Um, uh, remind me again the question before that one. Sure. When to plant annual summer grasses? Okay, so these warm season grasses, if you want to grow them, uh, you will put them in in your area at about the same time that people are planting corn. Corn is one of these warm season annuals, and so whether you're growing millet, sorghum sedan grass, or, or um, corn, it's going in then. So it's not an early spring planting. If you want an earlier crop for grazing that's an annual crop for some reason, you'd probably want to look at um, a grain crop um, or oats and peas or something like that. But if you want this midsummer warm season annual forage, then you've got to wait until the soil temperatures warm up a little bit and plant it right about the same time as you plant corn. Okay, very good, very good. Wow, this was chock full of information tonight. And if you have additional questions, you see Sarah's uh, email there, feel free to reach out to her uh, with additional questions. Also go to the website and look at her other uh, events that are coming up if you're in her area at some of the day-long events please take advantage also just as a quick plug um, as you know we're coming up on the NOFA summer conference we will have some um, livestock workshops there at the conference and fortunately Sarah won't be there um, but you can catch some of the other presenters that will be talking a little bit about grazing soil health and food health so please um, Come to the conference August 9th, 10th, and 11th at Hampshire College. You can go to nofasummerconference.org or nofamass.org, or you can reach out to me and I can assist you with getting registered. Um, big thanks to Sarah for taking time out of a very busy schedule. I looked at her event list and she's got some great events. I'm going to try and make a field trip to Vermont myself. Um, if you have not gotten a copy of her book, The Art and Science of Grazing, 
you can call, you can uh, go to Chelsea Green to order it, or they can order it from your website as well, right, Sarah? Yes, that's right. Okay, so please get that book. I've read some excerpts and it's been, uh, it's very, very informative, as well as feel free to pull down the um, handout that Sarah has sent. Um, if you have any troubles, uh, reach out to me at Anna at nofamass.org. I will get you, a, get you a copy of that handout. Uh, and lastly, the recording of this webinar will be up on our YouTube page and archive page by the end of the week. If you'd like your own copy sent to you, please, please, please give me a, a, a ring or email me and I will get you that link. This is something to study as I will go back and study this as well. Thank you to everyone for staying over a little bit. These questions were wonderful. Thank you for your participation and your time. We look forward to seeing you next month. Uh, we'll have Steve Gabriel talking about the right animal, the right time and the right place. You wanna check that out as we continue with our livestock and responsible grazing series as part of um, inspiring ideas from experts in the field. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Sarah. Look forward to seeing you all and hearing from you all next month. Have a great night. Thanks, Anna.